Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. The most frequent use for a texture in a rendering engine is obviously to provide image data for texturing an object. In that case, we read the data that is in the texture. However, there are also situations where we need to write to a texture. For instance, there are textures to which we render the scene, the so-called render targets, and textures that contain some other data such as depth information. And since I already gave those two examples, I can as well go ahead and implement two more classes that represent a render target and a depth buffer in today's video. Let's prepare our file for adding two new classes, which are the render texture and the depth buffer. A render texture has a regular texture, so we'll need to put a D3D12 texture in here. And in this case, because we are going to render to this texture, we also need a render target view of it. Now, in order to support different kinds of visual effects, like rough transparent objects and bloom, we need smaller versions of the image that is contained in the render target. The best way of storing those smaller images is by using MIP levels of the render target texture. And since we are going to render to those MIP levels as well, we need to have one render target view for each MIP level. Therefore, we need an array of render target views. This of course needs to be a descriptor handle and not a heap. And we also remember how many of those MIP labels we are going to use. And that's all the data members that we need to have for a render texture. Since this class also represents a texture, it will have pretty much the same design as the D3D12 texture class. That means that we'll have a default constructor and an explicit constructor that takes an initialization information structure. And because we are going to disable copy operations for this class as well, we need to write the move constructor and the move assignment operator. This move constructor simply moves the texture from the other instance into the texture contained in this one, copies the other data members and resets them in the other instance by calling the reset function. In the reset function, we reset the values of all render target views and the MIP count. However, we don't need to reset the texture since it was already reset when we moved it from the other instance. Next is the move assignment operator, which is exactly the same as the one in the 3D12 texture class. We only need to write a different move function. Here we use standard move to move the texture and then copy and reset the other member variables. And again, for this class, there is going to be a release function and also the usual accessors for the member variables. Because we have multiple render target views, we need an index as a parameter for the accessor function. Further, we can also return the shader resource view and the texture resource. If you're wondering why we don't have multiple shader resource views, that's because when we are going to sample a texture in a shader, we can tell the sampler from which MIP level exactly we want to sample, and we can do this using just one shader resource view. 
Now we can continue and write the explicit constructor and the release functions implementation. In release function, we free all the scriptor handles for render target views and also release the texture. One thing that I forgot is to also add a destructor for both D3D12 texture and this class, so let's do that now. The destructor is rather simple, it only calls the release function which will take care of freeing all resources. Now we can carry on and write the constructor. Here we use the information in the constructor parameter to create an instance of D3D12 texture. Next, we get the number of its MIP levels and check if it doesn't exceed the max value. Then the only thing that's left to do is to create a render target view for each of the MIP levels. To do so, first we need to fill in a render target view description structure. Here we need to specify the format of the render target and which type of texture we are using. In this case, it is of course a two-dimensional texture, so we need to select texture 2D. Finally, we set the MIP slice in texture 2D structure to 0. This MIP slice indicates the MIP level for which we are going to create a render target view. For each of MIP levels, we allocate a descriptor handle, create the render target view, and also increment MIP slice in the render target description, so the next view will be created for the next MIP level. This is all we needed to do for the render texture class, and now we can continue and write the depth buffer class. As the name indicates, this is a texture that contains depth information for the rendered scene. This class has a similar structure as the 3D12 texture and the render texture classes. That means a default constructor, an explicit constructor, disabled copy operations and so on. In fact, I can just go ahead and copy and paste the rest from the render texture class and modify that here. For the depth buffer, we only need a texture and a depth stencil view. We don't need any MIP levels and such. So that makes it a lot simpler to write the move operations. Since the only member that needs our attention here is the depth stencil view, I won't bother writing the reset and move functions as we did before, but just handle moving the depth stencil view in line as we write the move operations. Finally, we have the accessor functions, which again are pretty much the same as before. We now have to write the explicit constructor and the release function. Again, we start with the release function, which frees the depth stencil view and releases the texture. Then there is the explicit constructor, which in this case is a tiny bit more complicated than the other texture classes, and that's caused by how it like to use the depth buffer. In the most basic use case, the depth buffer is only written to. 
In that case, we could use the same procedure of creating a texture and the depth stencil view based on that texture. However, in this engine, we will also read from the depth texture. And that means that in addition to a depth stencil view, we also need a shader resource view. Now the problem is that the shader resource view format can't be the same as the one used for the depth stencil view format. This means that we can't base the view formats on the format used to create the texture itself. Fortunately, we can create textures using a typeless format, and then from that we can create a view that has a compatible format. So we assume that the format given in the resource description is the format for the depth stencil view, and we put that in a local variable. Then we replace it with the typeless format that we use to create the texture resource. Also, since we are creating a texture resource using a typeless format, we have to fill in the shader resource view description. Now we can create an instance of D3D12 texture using these descriptions. Finally, we are going to create the depth stencil view, which requires us to fill in the depth stencil view description. This concludes the basics of creating texture resources in Direct3D12. I hope you learned something new and also enjoyed watching this episode. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Also, please subscribe. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus, there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.